very strange ideas. Now I'm going to tell you a dream. And there was a dream I had when I was working on these ideas, and I'm going to tell you the dream for two reasons. One is because it bears directly on these ideas, and two because, well, we just covered psychoanalytic thought, and I want to show you how a dream can work. Because it's not easy to find a dream that you can interpret in a way that's public, that makes sense. Because they're usually so tightly defined contextually. You can define them in the therapeutic context, context because you know so much about the person. It's very hard to pull that out and make it meaningful outside of that context. But this dream works. Okay, so I was dreaming, I was dreaming that there was a small object. It was a circle, a sphere about this big. And it was floating on top of the Atlantic Ocean. And I was, I had a kind of a bird's eye view of it, and I was following it along, like maybe, you know, like a drone would follow behind an object. And it was floating, and it was, it was really zipping along, man. It was really, really fast. And then the scene shifted to a bunch of scientists. They were sitting inside a room full of television monitors, and they were watching this thing move across the ocean. And so it was here, and then there were, it, was, it had four hurricanes beside it, one here, one here, one here and one here. So it was in the center of four hurricanes. So whatever it was, was like some bloody potent thing. It was zipping across the, it was zipping across the ocean. Then the scientists got a hold of it, I guess, and the scene shifted, and I was in a museum, like an old Victorian museum. And this thing, this ball, was now inside a, a wood, so imagine a wood stand with a glass case on top of it. It was inside the glass case, and it was floating, and it was sort of pulsing a little bit. And so inside the room, there was Stephen Hawking and uh, the American president. I don't remember who it was. It, he was sort of faceless. But Stephen, I thought, Stephen Hawking, what the hell? Disembodied intellect. That's Stephen Hawking. So that's what that meant. And the, the president, well, he's just the symbol of order. And so this thing, whatever it was, that was surrounded by these winds, had been placed into a category system, right? It was in a museum, it was boxed in. It had been conceptualized and categorized, partly by disembodied intellect, that was Stephen Hawking, and partly by social order. And so there's a binswanger boss thing going on there. The thing pulses and is alive, so it's got its own power, but it's also encapsulated in a category system. So I'm a third person observer in there. I'm not in the room. I'm just seeing this. So that was fine. So the next thing that happened, oh yes, one of them described the features of the room. Its walls were seven feet thick. They didn't want this thing going anywhere. And it was made out of titanium dioxide. And I thought, what the hell's that? Well, it's a paint. It's a paint substance, but it's also what the hull of the Starship Enterprise is made out of. So, so my dream was saying, well, what's the hardest substance there is as well? It's titanium dioxide. It's not getting out of that box. The walls were designed to permanently constrain the object. Okay, now the next thing that happened was this object was, it was, you could tell it was kind of alive and it kept shifting around. And at one point it turned into a chrysalis, you know, a cocoon. And I thought, what the hell does that mean? And then, so it, it turned into a cocoon. And I don't know if you've seen a chrysalis when it's just about to hatch, but it's, it twi twitches around, eh? it's alive, that thing. So they're very strange things. And then at the end, it turned itself into a pipe, like a Meerschaum pipe. And I thought, then it reformed itself into a sphere and just shot right out of the room. Like, like the walls weren't even there. It was just, it decided it was gone. Bang, it was gone. And I woke up and I thought, what the hell? What the hell does that mean? It took me forever to figure this out. So then, about two years after experiencing this dream, I was reading Dante's Inferno. In the ninth canto, A Messenger from God, appears, so Dante goes down into hell, right? And, to, and it was Dante's attempt to describe, it's brilliant, it's, so imagine that you go to a bad place psychologically, right? So your life has collapsed, and that's terrible, but then you're trying to figure out what you did wrong and how you're to blame for it. And so what you do is a descent, a descent into your own foolishness and stupidity, level by level by level, and that's what Dante was trying to explain. That's what that hell was, levels of catastrophe, and there's something right at the bottom. And he found that it was betrayal that was at the bottom. So, in any case, I was reading that, and there's a line in there that made me remember this dream, because I tried to figure out this dream for years, say. Eh? Um, in the ninth canto, a messenger from God appears in hell to open the gate of Dis, which is barring the divinely ordained way of Virgil and Dante. The approach of this messenger, an angel, 
is preceded by a great storm described in the following manner. Suddenly there broke on the dirty swell of the dark marsh a squall of terrible sound that sent a tremor through both shores of hell, a sound as if two continents of air, one frigid and one scorching, clashed head-on in a war of winds that stripped the forest bare, ripped off whole boughs and blew them helter-skelter along the range of dust. It raised before it, making the beasts and shepherds run for shelter. So that was like a herald of the arrival of this messenger. It's a very powerful scene. And I thought about this dream with this thing with the four storms. So the pipe thing, that really, that really, that took me forever to figure out. And I finally remembered this painting by Magritte. This is not a pipe. Right. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is the representation is not the thing. It's a very famous painting, right? The representation is not the thing. Well, even the perception is not the thing, and that's what the dream was trying to get at. It's like this thing, this thing that was so powerful and so capable of transforming could be encapsulated temporarily within a conceptual system, but whenever it decided to leave, it was just going to leave. And so, what it was referring to was the potential that there is inside objects. So, for example, and it's a, such a complicated thing to explain. Nobody knew what cell phones were going to do. You make the cell phone, you think you know what it is. You don't know what it is. No one knew what the birth control pill was going to do. You make it, you think you know what it is. You have no idea what it is. And it's going to do some of the things you think it will do, and it's going to do a bunch of things you have no idea about. And that's because the th things are more complex than they look. They're multidimensional, and they have... I wouldn't say a life exactly, but they have an intrinsic complexity that tends to unfold across time. And it's only somewhat predictable. And so you have things under your control and in your grasp to some limited degree. But at any point, it's like the switch in the yin-yang symbol. At any time, chaos can collapse into order, or order can collapse into chaos. And that's what that dream meant. Another painting by Magritte trying to express the same thing, right? All men in suits, all uniform, all thinking the same way, same haircuts, completely socialized, blinded by their own perceptions. That's us. Because you think, well, your perceptions illuminate and, and bring you information. It's yes and no. They also constrain to equal degree.